Good morning for those of you joining us. Thank you so much. It's good to see some of you and know that you're here in spirit, even if we can't physically see you like me right now. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Kathleen. Good morning. <laughs> it's nice to see some of our newest members on the call. John, welcome. It's good to see mm -hmm. you. <clears throat> All right, y'all. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And between Amber and I, we will continue to let people in the room. Um, most of you all I know, but um, for those of you I don't, who I don't know, I'm LaShawn Gordon. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives here at UPHS and super excited to have you all. Um, also, you'll see her on camera a little bit. Um, our Executive Director and my co-presenter, Amber Tynan, is here. And I'll let her uh, intro herself a little bit and give a disclaimer and we'll yeah. get started. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, LaShawn. Um, it's so good to see some of your beautiful, bright faces. And for those of you that we can't see, just know that we're glad that you're here. Um, I will be off camera um, a little bit, hopefully coming on um, shortly. We are one of the 600 plus families in Leon County that are quarantined right now. Um, so I, my husband and I are both working from home. And if you've had to do that yet with your, your spouse or your partner, that is an interesting mix um, while we have a five-year-old here. So I am doing this more so for you all than for me to limit distractions, but I am here and I will come on as soon as I can. So um, just a couple of quick things. Um, the training is being recorded um, and this is one of those interactive things. So <clears throat> if you have questions or anything like that, feel free to stop, put it in the chat box, and we'll be happy to answer those questions. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing uh, my screen and we will go ahead and get started. You all bear with me. Oh, we had it. That was the, the wrong one. Oh. All right. So here we are. So the, the thing that we're talking about today is, um, hold on a second. Again, as we said, thank God tomorrow's almost Friday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're talking about enhancing the effectiveness and the sustainability of human service agencies. And one of the reasons why it was so important to do this training, um, most of you all know is that's what we do. We spend our day supporting human service agencies. And when you start talking about capacity building and sustainability, people always say, oh, well, you know, we've been a human service agency for 30 years and we've been doing this a long time. But one of the things that I want to impress upon you all today is that we work with entities who are multi-million dollar agencies that have been around 20, 30, 40 years, as well as entities who are just starting. And a lot of those agencies are having the same issues. So when it comes down to capacity building and sustainability, the nonprofit, the human service agency, if it's not a strong foundation, it doesn't matter the size or how long it's been around, it's still going to be an issue. <clears throat> so, so capacity building is not just about the capacity of a nonprofit. It's about the nonprofit's ability to deliver its mission effectively so just kind of hang on that word effectively now and in the future. 
Capacity building is an investment in the effectiveness and future sustainability of a nonprofit. So when you all kind of hear effectiveness or effectively, talk to me a little bit. What, what are your thoughts about that? How do you know a nonprofit, a human service agency is operating effectively? And we encourage you all to come off mute. We will be monitoring the chat, but it would just make it easier for us if you come off mute. Absolutely. Please. They're meeting so, their goals and objectives. Okay, okay. Goals are being achieved, Melanie says. What else? Um, this is Kathleen with Pace Center for Girls. LaShawn knows this better than anybody that the Pace program makes an impact on young girls in our community. And we see it every day in their progress as well as in their mental health capacity. Mm. Absolutely. That's great. Absolutely. Anybody else? Hey, this is Kim Ross with Rethink Energy Florida. I would also say when it comes to effectiveness, there's kind of an effective use of your what you have, your resources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather than doing, you know, minimizing the administrative piece and maximizing what you're using to, to give um, services. Absolutely. And we'll talk about specific areas that we see quite frequently with some of our members. But just for context for this, this presentation today is when we talk about the effectiveness of capacity building and the strength and sustainability of our, our nonprofit sector, what we talk about is really encouraging our members to take a hard look at where they currently are and the direction in which they wanna go. And with that, determining what resources are needed to get there, identify what other changes are required, um, but also recognizing that there is no universal solution for, for doing capacity building effectively. Each nonprofit is going to be very different. And as LaShawn said, we represent a cadre of grassroots organizations that have no paid staff all the way up to multi-million dollar organizations with hundreds, if not thousands of employees. So recognizing that every nonprofit is different in their journey. So any efforts to make improvements to get to where we want to be and we being you as you, you and your organization, it has to correspond to your specific situation. Absolutely. So one of the points we have here is that agencies must develop and strengthen their skills processes and resources in order to survive, adapt, and thrive in a fast-changing world. So you all know we've all had to pivot, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. We've had to rely on technology. You know, we've had to get creative in the way that we work with each other. But even if a pandemic wouldn't have happened, we still have to make sure we adapt, we change, we, we strategize. You know, there's this big thing with the sector where it's a lot of folklore and tradition, right? And it's, we've always done it that way. This is the way it's done. But if agencies don't, um, don't strengthen their processes and look at how they get their resources, then it's very hard to achieve sustainability. Because Absolutely. things are forever changing. Go ahead, Amber. Absolutely. And to piggyback on that, a lot of people, they're like, oh, processes. And they're like, I don't want another process. But this too is a process and something that you as your organization, but you also as the leader and or the, uh, the sweat equity piece as part of making the, the mission work happen you, it, it's something you have to continuously do in order to improve. Capacity building is not just looking at what's happening in the short term and what we need in the short term by way of success. It's about that systemic change. So that process over time, best practices uh, to work towards included targeting volunteer recruitment, strong leadership, effective programs, sound finances, updated technology, and a solid infrastructure are just some of the ways in which nonprofits can ensure their effectiveness. But it's, again, going to be very much tailored to who you are. And again, very much ingrained into uh, a process specific to where you are and where you want to be. And before we get into some various uh, topics and areas of focus uh, that we see quite frequently, we want to talk a little bit about why capacity building matters. 
And oftentimes it's, it's talked about in like this very sexy way. And yet we, we don't really know how to quantify that or uh, operationalize it in, within our institutions, but it's about improving management practices and that being a critical component to see, seeing the overall health and success of your organization. And oftentimes what we see is our member agencies, one, they're not skilled in this regard to understand what they need to do and where they need to focus, but rather it's oftentimes not prioritized. And when I say nonprofits, I'm talking from a staff perspective, volunteer perspective, and a, a board perspective. It has to take all of those uh, individuals collectively and individually to ensure that the success and the ability for the organization to achieve its mission um, in a prudent and effective way happens. Um, and without capacity building and a focus on that, what we find is that we risk focusing all of our energy or attention on providing services and expanding projects only. And that really lacks the foundation that may be uh, necessary for uh, organizational stability. Sorry, we're trying to admit people as we're talking. <laughs> this is fun. Um, and, you know, we lose focus of what our nonprofit's founding principles may be. So don't be so uh, focused on seeking support for the signature program that you fail to assess whether or not that program is actually functioning as well as it could, um, and that it's actually the best vehicle for your organization to meet its goals in the long run. And one of the things that I'll add, um, one of the big challenges <clears throat> and Nancy kind of put this in the chat a little bit, you know, that a lot of people focus on is staffing, there's a lot of fatigue, that sort of thing. And one of the things that we've been talking to agencies about is not only looking at things like that, but really evaluating your program as a whole, because ultimately, um, these are going to be high stress jobs, um, but they don't have to be that way internally. And so that's a part of capacity building also, really looking truly at what is the capacity of the team, looking at your funding levels. You know, we don't want people to feel like human service work or nonprofit work. I'm right there just a step above the poverty level. And so a lot of times what happens, and Amber mentioned this, as we're seeking funding for programming, we're, we're, just, we're doing just that we're not really taking a deep dive at, even though we wanna increase the services that we're providing, we really need to look at how we're compensating the staff. We really need to look at staff support, staff incentives. You know, if all of that, fun if, if, if we need all of that funding just to open up the program, mm, maybe we can't serve 50 people. Maybe we'll serve 25 people and compensate the staff a little better. So there are things like that that can really, really hinder the sustainability of an organization. And um, yesterday we, were we had a, a forum on organizational assessment and one of the things that we were looking at was staff retention. Staff retention and the, the effectiveness of the team um, and the culture of the team, which you'll hear us talk a little bit more about. So uh, we're going to move along here. And if and you guys didn't get the chance to participate in that Thought Leader Forum, it is on our YouTube page and we've shared it. It was fabulous. And I think it pairs nicely with what we're talking about today once there is a, a bit of a foundation uh, established within your organization, but to really examine, okay, here's where we are currently, where do we want to be? Again, I think it pairs very nicely. So feel free to check that out if you have not already. Um, so we'll get into one of um, the biggest tenets or pillars, if you will, that we see, and that's really capacity building from an organizational infrastructure uh, perspective. And you'll see some high level bullets posted here. And we'll talk a little bit about this, but we'd love to get your thoughts, um, whether it's from your individualized role or just collectively what you, what you see from the nonprofit sector perspective, what are some of the things that you think an organization, specifically a human services, not, not for profit should be focused on by way of capacity building when it comes to organizational structure? And you can put that in the chat. You can come off mute, whichever you're comfortable with. Where do you think you start?
they're like, I don't know. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of get going, you'll see that this slide is organizational structure. And <clears throat> when we sit down with people and we start talking about capacity building, this is a big one. What does the structure of the organization look like, right? Let's talk about the team. Let's talk about, are you gonna have a governing board? Are you gonna have an advisory board? Let's talk about your bylaws. Let's talk about your policies and procedures. So that organizational structure is really important. One of the things that happens with people who are all about serving and getting to the heart of the matter is, we like to jump to the doing, right? <laughs> like, hey, I'm starting this human service agency or, you know, I just started this job or you know what, I've been here forever. We're kind of retooling things. Let's go, 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 go. We jump to the doing, but we don't always look at the structure. And what do we know about structure? What stabilizes buildings? What stabilizes things is the foundation, right? So that foundation is really, really important. So the first thing, go ahead, Amber. No, absolutely. I didn't, see, this is what we do. We get so excited and passionate. We're like, got to talk. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, so to that point, um, and oftentimes we, we overlook this because it's, it's like, yeah, of course we have to do this, is the very first thing that we talk about when we're meeting with our member agencies or consulting with other organizations that are either just starting or at a plateau or at a place where they're like, we really need to reinvent ourselves. We really need to focus in on uh, getting to better and greater heights is establishing your mission, vision, and values. And oftentimes that's the first step that a, a lot of organizations, specifically nonprofits, fail to really define and refine over time to ensure that one, they're achieving what they were set up, uh, set up and set out to do, but two, ensuring that that mission is being achieved every single day um, through the work that they're doing. So with that, Without a strong mission, vision, and values that the staff, the board, the volunteers, whoever is involved in your organization can grasp, can, can sink their, their hands and teeth into and really understand and be able to articulate to the community what it is you do and why that makes you special and viable is critically important. Without those things, it's going to be very difficult for you and any other organization to get to another another plateau or success measurement. Um, so we, we'd like to start there, even prior to establishing the articles of incorporation and the bylaws, things that help you actually um, conduct your business and allow you to become an established organization is to clearly define who you are, who you want to be and what that means to those you serve so that then you can build upon uh, your internal systems and infrastructure to ensure that there are pieces in place to, to make that happen. And as LaShawn said, that starts with staffing patterns, that starts with your board, that starts with what other sweat equity would be necessary in order to achieve that. Um, and if you're not looking at your mission, vision, and values every single year, typically this corresponds with a strategic planning session or even an action planning session. Um, you're doing yourself and your organization a disservice. It is critical that you are constantly looking at your mission, your vision, your values to making sure that there is continued alignment with what you're doing. And if it isn't, that is A-OK, -okay. but it's about making the pivots and making the shifts, whether that's through strategy or through practice to make sure that it is aligned to, again, ensure that you have the effective viability to continue to, to serve um, folks within our community. Um, any thoughts on that specific to mission, vision, and values? How many of you all look at your mission, vision, and values regularly? Can y'all hear me? <laughs> okay, Nancy, fantastic, perfect. Comes up in your management meetings, yes. Um, we do, though not system systematically, yeah. Um, it purposes, perfect. Um, we would encourage, you know, whether this takes place at uh, each board meeting, 
a mission moment, uh, but keeping this top of mind to, again, making sure there are no pivots or shifts that have to occur. And then with that, part of the organizational structure, uh, we are required to have a board of directors uh, to help govern and guide and be the fiduciary responsible entity of our organizations. So being very strategic in how we build out our board of directors, our officers to, again, be responsible for the work that takes place from a governance perspective, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, deeper here shortly, but making sure that that is aligned with folks that um, know and love your work, have maybe benefited from your work, who um, have contributed to your work. There are a number of ways to ingrain people from all skill sets, demographic backgrounds, but again, making sure that there is alignment with the work that you're doing when you're building out who will be your governing structure. Um, oftentimes, a lot of our organizations are like, well, what number is really the best number? And it's really hard for us to demonstrate, well, you should really have a five member board or you should really have a 17 member board. It's really based on the work that you have before you and your internal capacity with staff to achieve that. Um, yeah. So we really help got, I'll go, we help guide what might be feasible, but we we will really look to you all to ascertain what would be most effective. Go ahead, LaShawn. So I was, <clears throat> the chat is blowing up, which you know, I love that. So I was gonna kind of go to the chat a little bit, which goes to our next um, slide, our, our next bullet point, which is organizational skills and talent. Um, and this right here is super important. Um, one of the things that Mandy said is that they're really kind of taking um, a deep dive and looking at their team, um, which is great. So one of the things that, you should be doing every year, whether you have two staff members, and y'all know we know, um, we just got a third <laughs> staff member, but we're a small team, is really, really looking at your organizational structure. And when it comes down to skills and talents, one of the things that you have to do is really focus on strengths. So one of the things that a mentor told me a really, really long time ago is that you have to take the personal off the table. And you have to look at whether or not people have the skills to do a good job. And sometimes with that, okay, so we're going to move you here. We're going to look at this, you know, but it's also about who do we need to bring in? What are we missing? What are those skills that we don't currently have on the team? And a lot of times in human service work, nonprofit work, because we do everything with our heart. We don't have the right people on the team because, well, you know, she or he, we're just trying to, and we can't do that because when we don't have efficient people, we don't serve our clients well. And that's yeah. one of those tough things, tough conversations we have with people every day, but it's super, super important. You want the best of the best on your team because what we're doing is vital, right? We're meeting the needs of the community in so many ways that we can't afford to have mediocre. And you have to also invest in your team. Mm. So if you're on this call, you're obviously connected to UPHS. One of the things we'll remind you of is our workshop and trainings are not only open to the EDs or the middle managers, they're open to the entire staff. And I can tell you, um, as someone who's supervised people for many years, a lot of times people just want to be professionally developed. Mm -hmm. People want to know that you're cultivating their skills and talents. But if you never reach back and do that, people are like, why am I here? I'm not getting the opportunity to go to training. Nobody's looking at my skills. I'm just here to be here. So you have to keep that as a priority. And to, to piggyback on that, and um, I can't believe we're almost 30 minutes into this training already, um, but this is incredible stuff. To piggyback on that, what we oftentimes have, have been beholden to as a nonprofit sector is the scarcity mentality. 
that because we are a nonprofit, we, we can't make profit, but that's not true. Anything that we make should be reinvested into the work that we do, our mission, our programs, our people. Um, but so often what we find is organizations, they hire people that don't have the, the accurate skill sets or the, the background professionally or through experience. What they do is they pay them ridiculously low wages. So they don't do the um, assessment on the, on the front end to really determine what a qualified uh, pay structure would be for all positions and benefits, et cetera, within their, their uh, local community workforce, but also the sector as a whole. And I would encourage you all to look from a statewide perspective too. And we have some, some data on that. But what we find is because we expect so much and we, we have this lean scarce mentality is we have constant turnover within the sector. And if we change that mindset to where we invest in knowing exactly what we need by way of salary so that when we go through this planning process internally, but also with our board, we can ask for the things that we need and adequately resource develop. But what we can also do is encourage uh, professional development to bring along those those second, third, frontline tier folks to be our future leaders when we think about succession. Um, but it also helps us to really recruit and retain some top talent to where, as LaShawn said, we aren't stuck in the mediocre mindset. And we are responsible for doing that, not only for us and our organizations, but collectively as a sector to say, we deserve more because we are truly that safety net for our community. And if we aren't feeding and supporting and nurturing ourselves and taking care of our teams, how can we then best do that for those we serve? Absolutely. The next one is the culture of the organization, um, which I am really a big fan of culture work, big, big fan of culture work. Um, many of you all know, some of you may not, but I actually worked at Pay Center for Girls for 16 and a half years, um, worked with Miss Kathleen for a year and a half or so. But one of the big things that was done every year was a culture assessment, because if the culture in the agency is not what it needs to be, the agency is going to struggle. When people walk in the door, when people interact with you, people are going to be able to pick up on the vibe. And that's just real. It doesn't matter what your outcomes say on paper. It doesn't matter what, okay, whoo, we made it through another season. Culture is the heart of the organization. How do you, go ahead, Amber. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. How do you interact with the clients that you're serving? How does the team work together? Um, you know, Amber and I, you know, we we didn't start calling ourselves the Wonder Twins. Somebody <laughs> coined that name for us because they saw how we work together, how we complement each other. And so you have to really figure out what is the culture of your organization? How do people see you? Because when people see you and say, when people see the organization and say, oh, you know, they serve a lot of people, but it's raggedy. Oh, you may not want to work there. It's a lot of turnover. They don't treat people well. The staff is disgruntled. They're unorganized. All of that is culture. All of but, that is culture. And I will tell you, LaShawn is absolutely right. When you don't think people are watching, they are. And people see exactly what they see. So it is, intent, it is important that you make this an intentional part of your process. And good organizational culture, it's not just about having fun or, you know, having some great perks. That's great, too. And I, we encourage you to have that. But it's created very intentionally. And it's done so with your staff, with your board. And it requires constant work and consistency. Um, it can motivate staff to have a sense of purpose. And the better your culture, the greater potential for your nonprofit to positively impact the community. Because again, people see what they see. And if they see, wow, they not only nurture and take care and pr provide self-care for their team and compensate them well, but they are providing excellent care and, and concern for those that they serve. That's going to lead to greater visibility and exposure. It's going to bring you to the forefront of potential new donors because people see what they see. 
Absolutely. So Ms. Kathleen um, just talked about how PACE does an annual survey. Um, and I can tell you all that that survey is anonymous, which is great. And um, the, the feedback comes back to the center. <clears throat> so the center talks about it um, as a whole. And from there, you really look at those gaps and those holes and what do you need to do from a culture standpoint. Um, what do you need to do as a team to really work on those areas of growth for the culture? Amber and I are actually working uh, with two agencies right now. Um, and it's interesting. One agency is a, is a multi-million dollar agency. Another agency is a smaller agency. And we're doing culture work with the team and the board. And surveys um, is one of those things that we're getting ready to do. And we're actually doing it both ways. So we're doing some anonymous surveys, but we're also giving people one-on-one -on -one time to sit down with us and talk about what they need, what they wanna see happen. So one big way, and you can write this nugget down to really, really impact the culture is to give people the opportunity to be heard. Give people the opportunity to be heard. We went in, we did this half a day retreat and people are still saying, thank you because all we wanted to do is be heard and get together as a team. That's it. So a lot of times we make it so deep. Oh, it has to be big. We got to do this. We got to do that. People want to be heard. And when people are heard and people are encouraged to be their authentic selves, you can really begin to look at the culture of an organization. So our next bullet point is organizational engagement and partnership. And that is another one. The organizational engagement, creating partnerships and community is super important. Your entity will never go to the next level if you don't have partnerships. And I want to talk about that a little bit. We want to hear from you all. When you talk about cultivating partnerships, does your agency have a plan? Is there a strategic, is there a goal around it in your strategic plan for creating partnerships? Talk to us about that. You can come off mute or you can put it in the chat. Uh, hey, this is Justin from CCYS. I can tell you from top to bottom, left to right, there's uh, nothing that we could do without partnerships from not just agencies, but individuals. Absolutely. Super important. And when we talk about this piece of organizational engagement, I, this is a big one for me because one of the things that I learned a long time ago is that engagement is not only being out promoting your organization, it's also networking and supporting other people. That's a big piece. Because one of the things that you want is for people to see you as a collaborative partner so they can then support you. Hey, do you know Ashley? She's amazing. Oh, you have a need for that? Yes, reach out to Miss Kathy, Miss Kathy at Safe Families. Oh, you were saying that y'all had leftover personal hygiene products. Why don't you contact Miss Kathleen at Pace and she can help you with that. The more you engage with people, the more you stay on the tip of their, the top of their minds. When you're not engaging and creating partnerships, people forget about you. That's just human nature. So even now in this virtual world, there's about 50, 11 million things going on every week. And we know because the two of us, we've been splitting all this stuff. Make sure that people see you. Make sure people see you with an agency polo shirt on or your name tag, or a lot of people have gotten creative and put their agency background up, but people need to see you engaged. People need to see you as a partner because if they don't, they will quickly forget about your agency. Amber, you wanna add anything? I just very quickly um, to that point, any opportunity that we identify for our agencies to leverage the synergy of another like entity, whether it be through similar programming or similar client service, take every opportunity to do that. 
the, the old adage that there is strength in numbers is so critically true, even in this uh, perspective, is if there are organizations that you can partner with and really leverage their momentum or vice versa, you're going to grow the impact not only for those that you serve, but those that they serve and our community collectively in a greater way than if you were to do it on your own. And if you don't know where to start when it comes to collaborations and partnerships, reach out. That's part of the reason we're here. We are about enhancing the delivery of service. Um, but it is so incredible what can be done collectively. I often say we're better together and to really leverage the strengths of other like organizations. Absolutely. <clears throat> and we see those comments in the chat. Super excited that uh, people have this a part of their strategic plan because people do. You'll be surprised. Um, a lot of the grant applications uh, locally and on the federal level say, who are you partnering with? And we sit with people all the time and they say, uh, well, uh, uh, I talked to Ms. K once. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so it becomes like, uh, well, we're not going to make up anything. You know, we may need to just look at going to the next level next year. So those partnerships are super, super important. So real quick, Nancy in the chat put in a, a question and I want to address it before we move on because we got a lot of other great stuff to talk about too. But she shares that they're currently looking at expanding their board and they realize there's some skill sets and um, some folks potentially missing. So ideas for finding great new board members. So there's a, a lot of ways that you can do that. There's um, resources through Leadership Tallahassee and Leaderboard, which are great, but Honestly, the best way to find your next best board member is through those you're currently connected with. Look at your donor list. Look at who's been engaged with your organization long term. Look at your volunteer list. Again, looking at how long they've been committed to service through volunteerism. Look at your current board members and who they know that maybe, you know, really uh, believes in the work that they're doing as a board member and could help bring them along. There are a lot of ways. Um, and LaShawn and I would be happy to talk with you offline specifically, Nancy, to this point. Um, but oftentimes it's, it's, it's the best way to find your best next new board member is within your organization already. A absolutely. <clears throat> so we're moving into agency management, um, which is a passion point for me. I love, 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 love working uh, with managers. And I really love working with middle managers because middle managers typically supervise the people that are doing the work. And so the first bullet is management capacity. And this one is a big one. You know, a lot of times what happens is people move into management positions because I've been at the agency a long time or it seems like the right fit, that sort of thing. But you really have to look at the capacity of the people who are supervising the people that are serving your clients every day. You know, what are their strengths and skills and ability? Are they capable of being great leaders? Because there's a difference between being a supervisor and being a leader and a visionary. Leadership style. Is it a shared inclusive type of leadership? Does it empower people? A lot of times what stops growth and sustainability is bad management. I'm gonna say it again. A lot of times what stops growth and sustainability is bad management because it's not inclusive leadership and it doesn't empower people. So what happens is the agency becomes poorly ran and people do the work, but they do it begrudgingly or they half do it. And then the clients don't get served well. So I have this very uh, unique way that I like to manage people. And it's from a very empowerment based perspective, but it comes with a lot of accountability. So it's basically saying is I'm going to coach you, mentor you, give you all the tools and support that you need and in return you're going to give 200% and make sure that we're not only serving our clients, but we're serving them well. So if you need anything, we got you. Oh, no. If you need to take care of your family, it's all good. We got you. But in return for that, we want you to do a good job. 
and it works. Because in this work, people want to be supported. People want to feel good. And then they'll do a good job. Any thoughts about that? <clears throat> so another one is innovative efforts. So this is a big one for managers because a lot of times what happens is people just like to supervise. Did you do the work? Did, you, did we hit the outcome? Did you do what I told you to do? What about this? What about that? <laughs> Negative. Are you being innovative? How are you motivating people? How are you getting people to get to the goal? So a lot of times when we sit with people and we say, how do you recognize your staff? And people say, oh, I bought in a box of donuts two weeks ago and I about crawl under the chair because I'm like, that's not innovative and creative. What are you doing outside the box to support and motivate and encourage people? And I can tell you this, I'm of the mindset that even though you're a leader or a manager, nothing should happen in the agency that you're not willing to do. So if that means you need to sit down at the front desk and answer the phone, sit down at the front desk and answer the phone. If you need to work with a client, do that too. I remember days where I would just say to people, you know what, I'm going to just do a duty for you. Don't even worry about it. Just go to your space. You know why? That's an innovative way of saying, I know you need some time and I appreciate you. A big one is also the capacity to recruit, hire, and train quality employees. If this is something that you're struggling with, we can help you do a deep dive and look at this. <clears throat> because I can assure you, there are some reasons why it's not happening for you. And one of the things that we have to do is get honest about what are the barriers? What are the barriers to recruiting, hiring, and training quality employees? A lot of times people will say it's salary. And in some instances that's true, but a lot of times it's not. A lot of times it's not. And to that point, I think it's it's critically important, not only for you here on the call today, but for all of the nonprofits we represent, is to look at this and yourselves honestly, because you're not ever going to get to a point to where you can recruit, hire, and train those quality folks if you're not willing to be honest and talk about where those disconnects are. It may hurt and it may sting a little, um, but it is essential to be able to, again, get to that next stepping stone of where you want to be, where you want to be, and then achieve long-term employee loyalty. Absolutely. And the last bullet point, and I'm going to turn it over to Amber, because, you know, I get all excited when we start talking about this stuff, is managing performance expectations. Um, a lot of entities don't have a set evaluation process. And I can tell you when you're hiring people and people come in in that first 90 days, if they don't know whether or not they're doing a good job or they made it off of probation, then there's a likelihood you're not going to retain them. People have to be evaluated. How do you manage performance expectations? If this is something that you're not doing within your agency, then you need to take a pause. You need to take a pause and really look at, okay, we need to get some evaluation tools in place. Are you, are you having one-on-one -on -one meetings with your team members on a regular basis? How do people know they're meeting the expectations? Those are the things that help people stay with agencies is that constant feedback about developing and growing. Do you have goals for your team members? And I can tell you a lot of people don't. A lot of the bigger entities don't. And that's one of the things that we have to do with slowing them down. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me somebody can work for you two years and they've never had an evaluation before? Where, huh? <laughs> so managing those expectations are super important. And the last nugget I'll leave you with is this, and then I'll turn it over to Amber, is this right here. If you don't have set performance standards, you manage people off of feelings. You manage people off of feelings. Well, you know what? Last week, 
last month she was late three times. So now this is a performance issue. Uh -uh. When was the last time you sat down and you talked about it? Is this a part of the annual evaluation? Do you have a goal around this? You can't manage performance expectations based on your feelings. You have to have those set expectations in place. Ooh, that's a word. <laughs> well, now we're moving into like the, the most boring fun part of, of capacity building with the board governance piece. Um, and as we all know, boards are essential, um, but they're also designed to really impact the overall viability of the organization. As board members, they are there to really guide the, the policy and the direction of the work given the mission values and, and uh, mission, vision, values, yes. Um, but also, you know, putting, putting into place the necessary supports and resources in order for the organization to adequately function to, again, meet those goals. Um, board performance is a big one. So oftentimes, LaShawn and I, when we're meeting with member agencies, we will ask, how often does your board meet or when was your last board meeting? And we will hear a number of things, but oftentimes it's like, well, it's been, it's been a couple months or it's, uh, it's been a little while. That is a problem. Your board, because of their fiduciary responsibility, they have to be engaged. Um, and again, this is for you all to determine, but at least, at least once a quarter to ensure that the organization is adequately functioning in a way that is prudent to the policies that are in place, but again, driven to, to meet the mission. And with that, um, really developing goals by way of the strategic plan or even an action plan for the board to know that they are being effective. Do you have things in place for them to know that they have to attend X amount of meetings or their, their next renewal may not be an option for them? Are they expected to participate in committee work? And if so, how do you build out that alignment for them? Is it based on their skill sets? Is it based on um, what they do professionally? Making sure that, again, that is aligned so that it uh, uh, helps you achieve your outlying goals for the overall organization. But also being willing to, to take a step back and say, you know, this just isn't working out. Give board members the opportunity to out themselves and to say, you know, I really don't have the time to devote to this so that you can get somebody in the place that can help, again, make sure the, the mission and goals are being achieved. Um, and we, we encourage that um, each of our members go through a board evaluation or performance evaluation each year. Typically, it's at the, the end of your fiscal year. For us, it's at the, at the end of September. And we do a full review to see how, how often a board member attended a meeting. Did we have quorum? Were there issues? Were they engaged? If we needed them to be uh, available on an advocacy issue, were they there, et cetera? But be willing to step in and actively evaluate your board's performance as it relates to the goals of the organization. Fundraising is another huge piece of this. Oftentimes boards are like, ah, we're not, we're not a fundraising board. If you are on the board of an organization, you are responsible for making sure that the financial viability of the organization is sound. And that may mean that sponsorships are, are requested. That may mean that there are personal solicitations and fundraising requirements. Um, so with that, we, we have some uh, ability to help our agencies implement uh, some supports as well as um, uh, programming to ensure the effectiveness of board success and fundraising. But it is absolutely the board's role and responsibility to be engaged in that. You may have a development director at your organization and they are responsible for the day-to-day -day activities, but as it relates to the materials or the things to equip the board to be successful in their asks or through the stewardship process, um, it's about aligning that and how they can utilize their skill sets to see achievement in that area. Um, and board leadership, this is, this is essential. Um, the typical Pareto theory, 20% of all board members do 80% of the work. And we see that quite frequently in the work that we do. Um, but it's essential to, again, have a matrix of those skill sets in those areas that you really need based on the goals that the organization has set forth for itself. 
and put board members in positions of leadership, whether it's as a chair, whether it's as an advisory committee, whether it's whatever it may be to ensure that they feel one engaged in the process, but you can lean on and glean from the expertise they're bringing from the table. Um, touched on this a little bit, the monitors and evaluates the effectiveness of the overall strategic plan. Um, so while, while the board in concert with the, the staff helps to create the strategic plan, ultimately the board, each and every time they meet, they should be reviewing where we are in the process. Um, whether it's a one year, two year, three year, five year plan, um, we encourage any and all of those, but to at least have a, a, an annual strategic plan to be able to say, are we, are we meeting the mark? Are we able to effectively achieve our mission through the strategies and, and goals that we have set for ourselves? And if not, being able to evaluate and monitor that in a way that you pivot or shift strategies if necessary. Because why, why would we continue to do the same thing over and over again, but yet as a society, it's what we've been ingrained to do. If we know as an organization, something's not working, we have to also be willing to have those conversations to say something needs to change. Um, and the board can be an effective uh, player in that process. Um, and again, reviewing how to monitor the organizational financial condition in the future. So where you are today isn't necessarily where you will be next year or where you want to be. And with that, in order to achieve whatever that goal may be, it's going to take resources. Those resources may be personnel. Those resources may be um, finan financial uh, resources. It could be additional facilities, whatever it may be, it's going to require capital and funding to achieve that. So the board has got to be instrumental in knowing their role as well as how they can help support to grow the financial capacity of the organization as well. <clears throat> Anything you would add to that, LaShawn? So I just wanted to um, acknowledge Mandy's comment in the chat and um, kind of talking about how the staff and the way the, the staff see the board and the board and the staff kind of feeling like the board is their safety net. And I'll kind of speak to that um, just a little bit. Um, I've, I've served on a lot of boards and done work with quite a bit of boards as well. And one of the things that I'll say is if you have the staff interacting with the board, you have a messy situation because the board is really not there for the staff. The board is there to support agency events and, you know, for example, if they're serving food or they're coming to a program, but best practices for the, is not for the team to have relationships with the staff because that's where you kind of get that tattletale dynamic, uh, that sort of thing. And so there's a really fine line with that. And I have had situations where we just kind of had to call that out because you don't want that in your agency. What happens in your agency happens in your agency every day. And there's a certain part of things that are reported to the board, but the board doesn't run the day-to-day -day operations of the agency. The ED in partnership with the management team, the team, so when you have situations like that, we have to really sit down and call those things out. Because yeah. Go ahead, Amber. And I know we're running up on time, but to that, what the board is responsible for by way of staff is the executive director. Mm -hmm. And one thing I failed to mention, but we see it doesn't happen as frequently as it should, is there should be an, an, an annual evaluation process with the executive director, with the board each year. They help hire and fire and pr produce the goals for that individual. And then from there, the ED is responsible for the remainder of the staff, which uh, as LaShawn just eloquently um, associated. But uh, if you don't have that process in place, call us. We can help you. We have some, some resources, but it is essential, especially as you go through a new uh, strategic planning session or you re re revising goals for the organization, the ex executive director needs to be evaluated on how they're helping to implement the, the strategic plan to again, achieve success by way of mission. Absolutely. So I knew we were going to do this. We said we're going to only do a, a few slides for this reason. And now it's already 1054. So we're going to kind of run through this a little bit. <clears throat> and this just means that we need to do a part two, which we love that. So delivering the mission effectively for sustainability. So 
together mission vision guide strategy development um which we kind of talked a lot about that helps communicate the organization's person uh, purpose and informs stakeholders of goals and objectives this is a big one and we talked about it earlier your mission should be at the center of everything that you do and Amber hit on that earlier. And a lot of times um, what we like to do is bring people back to the why. What is the why? What is the reason why you do what you do? And a lot of times people struggle with the why because the why doesn't match the mission and the vision of the agency anymore. Developing guiding principles that is agreed upon by agency leadership. <clears throat> Some agencies have guiding principles that are gonna be with the agency forever but it does not mean that within the culture of your own team, you can't have guiding principles or values or goals that you're gonna always agree to, this is how we're going to do our work. That is super, super important. <clears throat> Engaging community members. You heard us talk about this. Creating partnerships is essential. You can't get the work done without partners. You just can't, you can't. As Amber say, we're so much better together. Enlist leaders from all sectors to work with you. One of the unique things about United Partners for Human Services is we're a melting pot. So it's not just human service agencies, it's not just nonprofits, it's bankers, it's business people, it's attorneys, it's all types of people who we work with because you need all of that to be successful. And then lastly, <clears throat> establish policies and procedures so that you ensure smooth operations. If you don't have a policy and procedure manual, we gonna ask you to get in timeout. <laughs> because you cannot run an agency without policies and procedures. Because one of the things about it is you can always go back to the policy. Okay, we're talking about, um, we're talking about attendance. We're talking about staff this. We're talking about client. Okay, let's go back to the policy and procedure manual. If you don't have policies, like I said, get in time out. And if the policy and procedure manual hasn't been touched since the agency opened, which Stay in we time out. Right. <laughs> we discovered as we're working with agencies, when was the last time you revised the policies? We've never revised the problems policies. That is problematic. Amber, you want to add anything? I, I wouldn't. Um, I would love to open it up for any questions. Um, I know this was like a high level like fast round and we will commit to a part two because there's so much more but would love to hear from you all um as it relates to some of the things that you heard as well as some areas that maybe would be helpful to focus on for the part two um and justin just to answer your question um i do suggest looking at the policy and procedure manual every year mm -hmm. i used to serve on a team that would get with people across the state and that was what we used to do go through the policy and procedure manual with a fine tooth comb and one of the reasons for that is if you're contracting with djj dcl the city or the county of tallahassee whoever their policies change every year our contracts change every year and your manual should always be matching your contract so that you're not out of compliance. Absolutely. And the other best practice that we would uh, recommend when looking at your policy and procedure manuals is to have folks that maybe it's a client related policy, have folks that don't work directly with clients review it as well for an objective set of eyes to maybe think through things that the policy may, may be missing. So it really just helps to have a more well-rounded, holistic um, uh, manual in the, in the long run when you have multiple sets of eyes, even those that aren't necessarily working within a specific policy or procedure specific to their skill set and class, job class. Any other questions or thoughts? Chesley came off mute. Oh, she went right back on mute. <laughs> it's a question I I, I struggle with. Um, Lashawn, going back to when you were talking about uh, evaluations and set standards, um, we just had this conversation with our management yesterday, and it's been a little while since everybody was at home and doing work, and we kind of set those aside for the past year. 
Um, but coming back to, you know, needing to, to kind of evaluate where we're at and all of our teams and staff, um, we struggle because we have those set standards and we do have the evaluation, we have the, the procedure in place. However, we don't have a means of increasing salaries or having bonuses or having anything really tied to those evaluations. And so then I feel like I don't know what to offer staff when I'm like, yeah, you did really great. And we're going to set these goals for growth, but what, what then you're going to keep growing and you're going to keep adding to your skill sets and um, developing. And I'm going to keep writing it down on these evaluations, but where do we go from there? I think there's a couple of innovative things that you guys can do and we can certainly meet with you offline, but when we think about employers of choice and when you don't have the means to incentivize them through salary increase, there are other things. So uh, day off on their birthdays, half days off, you know, for the, every Friday um, due to great performance. It could be, you know, hey, what is it that, that would be meaningful and beneficial to you? Again, opening up that dialogue of what would be um, meaningful to you and getting that feedback and being able to implement that. It could be, you know, uh, maybe you can't give them a salary increase, but what you can do is you can bring in lunch every month for the staff to just have like a breathing moment to where you can just come in, be your authentic selves, not have to think about work for a minute. You get a free meal, but you also get to just be real and, and one with your fellow colleagues. Um, these are just off the top of my head, I'm sure we can think of a ton more and we have, um, but I think you guys, you could be super creative without it being um, a stressor on the, the overall budget, but still be meaningful and have an impact for those that it benefits. LaShawn, what do you think? Yeah, I, th- <clears throat> I think all of those things are good. Um, when you can't give salary increases, um, like Amber said, you have to get creative. One of the big ones is time off. And so, you know, looking at around the holidays, um, you know, I've been in agencies there years where things were tighter. So we may not be able to let everybody off, but you know, right around Christmas time, you all can take the first three days, you all can take it around New Year's, really doing it that way so that people feel like, well, they did give me something, you know, I, I most state entities don't do this, but like, that was pretty big of them to do that. Here's one more. Here's one more I'll share. And I know we're over time, but it's one that I love. I've, I've heard of some of our agencies doing, and I'm working with our board to kind of implement it here at UPHS. But if you work in an organization where the policy is you can only roll over a certain amount of time each year, paid time off, leave, whatever, um, being able to create a policy where it gives flexibility to the staff member to withdraw up to two weeks, four weeks, whatever at a time to give them extra cash. That is a great way to ensure that one, if they can't utilize their time, it doesn't get lost, but to also provide them some other financial um, benefit and incentive um, to maybe consider if that's an option for you all. And please reach out because we probably got about a bunch of these on a flash drive somewhere. And I know we're over, so that means we need to have a part two. So we appreciate you all. Uh, We will send out the recording, of course, and you all be well, and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye, y'all. Appreciate it, thank you. Bye. Goodbye, good job, thank you guys. Thank you.